morning, brothers and sisters. Let's go to the Lord in prayer at this time. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful morning. We thank you for the opportunity to come around your word, and we're grateful for the desire in our hearts to do that. We also thank you, Father, at this time for your presence with us, and we pray that you'll bless those partaking in this service, those that are leading in any shape or form, Father, that what we do and what we say may be pleasing to you, and it may rise to you as a sweet fragrance. Father, we pray that we may have examined ourselves before coming before the table and the emblems, and that we'll have asked for forgiveness, and that we will have forgiven those who have wronged us. So please stay with us, Father, and bless us at this time. For this we pray in your son's holy name. Amen. Good morning. What a beautiful day it is to worship our Lord. Let us praise him with let us praise him this morning with joy in our hearts. Our first song will be Let Us Worship and Bow Down. Now there will be instructions on this slide that indicate who will be speaking, whether it'll be me, the men, or the women. So just follow that. Okay. So we'll start. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our God, our maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture. He is our God, and we are the sheep of his hand. Let us worship the Lord in holiness. Let the whole world stand in awe. He will come to judge the world in righteousness and truth. Let the men say, Men, let us worship the Lord in holiness. Let the whole world stand in awe. He will come to judge the world in righteousness and truth. Let the lady say, Ladies, let us worship the Lord in holiness. Let the whole world stand in awe. He will come to judge the world in righteousness and truth. Let us all say, Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture. He is our God, and we are the sheep of his hand. Let us now have the Old and New Testament readings. Good morning, church. Reading from Second Kings. Chapter 14. Chapter 14, verse 7 to 14. I'm reading from the New Kings James. At 7, chapter, chapter 14, verse 7. To 14. He killed 10,000 Edomites in the Valley of Salt and took Sela by war and called its name Jochiel to this day. Then, then uh, Amaziah uh, sent messages to Jehoash, the son of Jehoahaz, the king of Jehu, king of Israel, saying, Come, let us face one another in battle. And Jehoash, king of Israel, sent to Amaziah, king of Judah, saying, The thistle that was in Lebanon sent to Sida that was in Lebanon, saying, Give your daughter to my son as wife. And a wild beast that was in Lebanon passed by and trampled the thistle. You have indeed defeated Edom, and your heart has lifted you up. Glory in that, and stay at home. For why should you meddle with trouble so that you fall, you and Judah, with you? But Amaziah would not heed. Therefore Jehoash, king of Israel, went out. So he and Amaziah sent king of Judah, faced one another at Beth Shemesh, which belongs to Judah. And Judah was defeated by Israel, and every man fled to his tent. Then Jehuhash, king of Israel, captured Amaziah, king of Je Judah, and son of Jehoash, and son of Isaiah, 
at Beth Shemesh. And he went to Jerusalem, broke down the wall of Jerusalem from the gate of Ephraim to the corner gate, 400 cubits. And he took all the gold and silver, all the articles that were found in the house of the Lord and in the treasuries of the king's house and all cities and returned to Samara. Amen. First uh, John 2, 12 to 17, reading the uh, NIV. I am writing to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. I am writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I am writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, dear children, because you know the father. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God lives in you, and you have overcome the evil one. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever do the will of God lives forever. Every step we take in our Christian walk leads us closer home. Let us be joyful and grateful for all this journey has. Let us share it with everyone. For when we reach our home, there will be no more sadness, no more sorrow, only eternal joy as we live beside our God for eternity. Our next song before the prayer of the church will be we're marching to Zion. Again, there are cues on the screen to indicate who will be speaking. If you're able, please be upstanding and remain standing for the prayer of the church afterwards. <laughs> Come we that love the Lord and let our joy go. Let us join in a sweet accord and thus surround the throne. Because we're marching to Zion. Beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to Zion, the beautiful city of God. Let the men say. Let the women say. Let it be. Then let our songs abound and every tear be dry. We're marching through Emmanuel's ground to fairer worlds on high. We're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to Zion, the beautiful city of God. We'll now have the prayer of the church. Let's pray. You continue to thank you, O Lord for your mercies and your opportunity we give us today to see your beautiful day. We thank you, we bless your holy name. We give you the praise, we give you the glory. Father, we come before you to sing and praise to you this morning. We pray, commit your church into your hand today, Father. Our prayer is continue to be with us. Wherever you are gathered to worship you, let your Holy Spirit come and guide us, Father, and lead us to give you the successful offer today. Father, we continue to pray to the churches of Christ all over the world. We pray for the Christians, those who are persecuting your Christians. Father, forgive us our sins and deliver us from these people and let your worship grow all over the world. As we are gathered to worship you, Father, we commit our leaders into your hands today. Those who are leading the, your church this morning, continue to be with us and 
let us give you the only offer into your name, not from our mind. You commit the leaders in the Church of Christ, come, come on to your hands, continue to be with them and give them the wisdom, knowledge to rule the church so that they can give, feed your children. We thank you, we bless you for what you've done and what you're going to do for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Before the Lord's Supper, we'll say the words to this song. When it gets to the fourth stanza, we're going to say it a bit more softly. Um, the, the fourth stanza starts, see from his head, his hands, his feet. We'll say that a bit softly. And then when we get to the, the fourth stanza, which is where the whole realm of nature mind, we'll say that a bit more passionately. All right. So just follow the cues in the slides. So starting from the first stanza. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and poor contempt on all my pride. Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast, save in the death of Christ my God. All the vain things that charm me most, I sacrifice them to his blood. See from his hands, his hands, his feet, sorrow and love will mingle down. Did there such love and sorrow meet? or for to compose so rich a crown. Where the whole realm of nature mine, that were a present far too small, love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. Let's repeat that last one. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. Good morning, brothers and sisters. I hope you can hear me. In remembrance. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. First Corinthians chapter 11, verse 28. If there is ever a time when we should be more serious and heart searching, it is the preparation for the taking the Lord's Supper. What did Paul say? He said we are to examine ourselves, not to discover whether we are worthy to participate, but to, to determine if we are partaking in a worthy manner and for a worthy purpose. You and me know that no one merits the privilege of sitting at the Lord's table. We are here by God's grace. We are given the privilege of becoming his children and having fellowship with him. The psalmist prayer is always appropriate as we seek to create a proper attitude for the observance of the Lord's table, of the Lord's supper. What did he say? He said, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me, I know my thoughts. And see if there be any wicked in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Psalm 139, verse 23 to 24. The Lord's Supper is a memorial supper that is to remind us of Jesus Christ's death on the cross for your sin and for my sin. By our participation in the Lord's table, we proclaim Christ's death. And we are to do this until he returns. The book of 1 Corinthians chapter 11 explain all this clearly. So far from 23, say, so for I have received of the Lord, that which also I deliver unto you, that the Lord Jesus the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he break it and said, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you, these do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also, he took the cup, and we are also said, this cup is in the New Testament, in my blood. These do ye as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Brother and sisters, and those who are watching us, 
to properly participate in the Lord's Supper, we need to be baptized. We need to hear the gospel. We need to believe the gospel. We need to confess our sin. We need to confess Jesus Christ as the Lord and our Savior. We need to be a committed believers. We take a new one look and forward look. And then we can participate in the Lord's table. Let's have a word of prayer. Our dear everlasting God, we are grateful to you for the greatest love that you gave to us. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who gave his body and his blood for our sin. So we could always be forgiven. As the church is about to participate in this remembrance, we pray that you help us to remember just how important and only our participation is. This we pray in Jesus' name, our Lord. Amen. After the bread, in the same manner, he took the cup, blessed it, and divided it among his disciples. Shall we pray? Once again, we thank you, Lord God, for your mercy and your goodness. And we thank you for the opportunity that you've given us to remember the sacrifice that you make on the cross of Calvary. Bless us. Bless every soul that will participate in the Lord's table. And those that have not accepted you, we pray that with this message today, be able to know that the only way to be saved is through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. As he said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And they also can participate, uh, baptize and participate in this street fellowship. Bless this cup, for we pray in Jesus' name, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you. That's end the past. Just to add to the thoughts of what we should do in the Lord's Supper, I found a poem online called The Nail, and it's not on the screen, but I just want us to listen to the words of it. It says, The nail is used for many things, a useful securing tool. A hammer is taken by the hand and drives it. That's the rule. A nail is needed when you build. It's a necessary thing. It was also used over 2,000 years ago to hang upon a tree, the king. He took the pain and suffering for all mankind you see, yet he took the torture just for you and he took it just for me. You cannot keep a good man down. Through the years, many have said, he went down a man and rose a king to deliver the spiritually dead. He is on the throne at God's right hand, the first, the last, the great I am. No nail, no hammer can touch him now the mighty king on high. What he built is forevermore salvation for you and I. See when you see a simple nail with its sharpened end and need to build or repair. Lift up your eyes, your heart, your and mind and thank him with a prayer. Before the sermon reading followed by the sermon this morning, let us say the words to this song, my hope is built on nothing less. For this song, I'll be saying the verses and I want us to read and listen to the words and then I'd like us to respond with the chorus. Again, just follow the cues on the screen. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus Christ, my righteousness. 
I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. Let us all say, on Christ, the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When darkness veils his lovely face, I rest upon his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. Let the men say, on Christ, the solid rock I stand, other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. His oath, his covenant, his blood support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. Let the women say, When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, and him my righteousness alone allows me to stand faultless before the throne. Let us all say, on Christ, the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. Amen. We'll now have the sermon reading. Reading today is taken from Proverbs 15, verse 24. It's just one verse, so I'm going to read it four times from four different versions. The NASB says, The path of life leads upward for the wise, so that they may keep away from Sheol below. The Living Bible, the road of the godly leads upward, leaving, leaving hell behind. The NIV, the path of life leads upward for the prudent to keep them from going down to the realm of the dead. The NLT, the path of life leads upward for the wise. They leave the grave behind. The constant, obviously, is to look upward. So it'd be good. So to be godly, to be wise, to be prudent, because the alternative is very great. Well, hello, hello to everyone on Zoom and on Facebook. Truth FM broke this morning, so we're not using that just now. Broke in here, didn't break on the radio and good to see everyone who's here with us this morning. If you take your Bibles to the book of Philippians, our whole lesson is going to be based in the book of Philippians. I appreciate Pete taking the effort there to come up with those different translations uh, to have a look at that particular verse from Proverbs. We're not really going to go back to it, but I think it sets the tone of what we're talking about. This month we're going through, as we continue our study of growth, this month we've got a particular focus on some of the ways in which we grow. And uh, in a couple of weeks, Adam will be talking about citizens of earth, how we live and interact with the world. He might take it in that direction. He might choose a different direction. Today, we're going to talk about how we are citizens of heaven. And for that, I think we have to understand a mindset and <clears throat> a way of living in our own minds, never mind the pragmatics and the practical aspects of it, which I think Adam uh, will give more attention to in a couple of weeks. For example, in Colossians chapter 3, Paul sets out there that we are to set our mind on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Not to set our mind on things here on earth, but to set our mind on things that are above. And I think we recognize that when we have a goal, when we have a target, when we have a purpose in our life, it begins an act of transformation that is within us. And in the book of Philippians, that's certainly one of the things that we're going to encounter as we go through it. So let's turn to that book. We're going to start in the first chapter. We're not going to go through the entirety of the book, but we are going to look at a significant portion of it and see how it reflects upon this journey that we have undertaken as Christians. Having decided that we want to go to heaven, having decided that we want to be part of eternity with God and not separated from him. Beginning in Philippians chapter 1, 
I'm going to start, first of all, in verse 3. Quite a long reading. We're going to go down to verse 11. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making request for you all with joy. For your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you <clears throat> will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ, just as it is right for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my chains and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers with me of grace. For God is my witness, how greatly I long for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ. And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and in all discernment, that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. So Paul sets out a thankfulness that he has for the Philippian church, and this is very pertinent in Paul's life because Paul is a prisoner. Paul has made a journey earlier in his life, not much earlier, but he's made a journey with a collection and with a vow to go down to Jerusalem and to worship God, to be there in one of the feasts. And when he's been there, he's been arrested and imprisoned simply for being a Christian, simply because he is teaching that which is contradictory to the traditions of the Jewish elders, not to the traditions of the Bible, not to the traditions of Moses and the prophets, but simply because he is asserting that Christ is Lord. For that, he's a prisoner. He might be writing this in Caesarea in the Roman city prior to his departure, or he might be writing it from Rome where he ends up. And you can read that story in the book of Acts in the final few chapters and from about chapter 21 through to the end of the book. How is it that someone who has been so grievously uh, treated by his own people, who has been ruthlessly handed over and exploited by the authorities during that time, put in chains and gone through shipwrecks and been bitten by a snake in Malta and finally made his way to Rome where he's been kept a prisoner and even then still rejected by those of his own people of the Jews? How is it he keeps going on? Because he focuses on what lies ahead. He focuses on what's in front of him. And notice his opening words in verse 6. Being confident. Brethren, confidence is a wonderful thing. Sometimes there's confidence that you're, you're making the right turns and ending up at the right place where you're supposed to be. Sometimes there's a confidence that you are seeing the words the way that they're meant to be pronounced. There's maybe a confidence in our, in our physical, in our mental strength that we have but is there a confidence in this very thing that God has begun to work in us and that it will be completed as we make that journey to the day of Christ remember first and foremost that it is God who has begun this work in us and in verse 7 he emphasizes this how you are all partakers with me of grace oh the wonders of God's grace in our lives that demonstration of God who self-reveals, who makes himself known to humanity, even though we have grasped for him, even though we have tried to understand him, even though the human mind has invented all sorts of things about what they think a God or gods might be like, God in his grace said, here I am. And to Moses, he said, I am who I am. I will be who I will be, whether it be Jacob in the wilderness, promising him as he made his journey from Canaan back to find his own family where Laban lived and discovering a God who traveled with him and was not bound by the boundaries and nationalities of the peoples of that time. In verse 10, this confidence that we have will prove excellent things. We must be sincere and not stumbling but that is to say, causing others to stumble as well. We have to have the kind of confidence where we can walk and we're not afraid of the Lego in the middle of the night for those spiritual things that might get in the way, those harmful things that might affect our spiritual walk. And in verse 11, talks about how 
In turn, we are filled with the fruits of righteousness. Galatians 5 will go on and talk about the fruit of the Spirit and describe it. You know, it's an interesting thing, fruit. You know, in Scotland, we're not really afraid of scurvy, so we don't do fruit and veg an awful lot. But when we do, it's an interesting thing. You know, you get a bit of fruit, you open it up, there's the skin, you maybe peel it off, you find the, the lushness of the, of the fruit, the meat, if you will, of the fruit inside, you find the seed and all the various components, and all of them together make the fruit that it is, be it an apple, an orange, uh, that's about only fruits I know being Scottish. But you know, you consider those things. Well, likewise, the fruit of the Spirit is all those things. You put them all together, that's the fruit of the Spirit, which is probably why it's singular. We have to discover the fruits of the righteousness of God. Go to Romans 3, 20, starting at 21, and just read right through to the end of chapter 8. And do you not see in there the righteousness of God? Now he calls us to live in that righteousness. And all of it only possible because of Jesus. He begins the work, says Paul. And so we have to let him finish what he started. There is nothing about me, nothing at all, that would allow God to look at me and say, you've done well enough, that's good enough. He never says that, but he sees it in his own son. So let Christ into your life, obey him through the call of faith, be baptized into Christ for the remission of sins, and discover that grace of God that is then allowed to work in your life, empowered by the Spirit, to become confident in that salvation of which Paul speaks in these verses. Beginning in verse 19, we're going to read down to verse 26. <clears throat> and what you might notice in some of the readings that we do, we skip over paragraphs, because what Paul does in the next paragraph is expound and expand either what's about to come or what's just been said. Well, those are the pragmatics, and we're not concerned with them as much as perhaps we would like in the time allotted to us. So let's skip on to verse 19. For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but with all boldness, as always so, now also Christ will be magnified in my body. For to me... To live is Christ, and to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, this will mean fruit from my labor, yet what I shall choose I cannot tell. For I am hard-pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to remain here in the flesh is more needful for you. And being confident of this, I know that I shall remain and continue with all of your, uh, with, with you all for your progress and joy of faith, that your rejoicing for me may be more abundant in Jesus Christ by my coming to you again. Paul wants us to, re to understand that he is being assured because of this relationship that he has with Jesus. And he sums up with those beautiful words that I've known since the earliest days of my life as a Christian. For me to live is Christ and to, and to die, to die is gain. Well, I'm 30 odd years later, I think I understand it a little better now than I did when I started. I think I've set off on a journey 33 years ago that would allow me to try and grasp why Paul felt that his life should be given over to Christ and in the event of death, there's just gain. And it is a journey, it's, it's, it's a path that needs to be taken and well trodden upon. In verse 20, notice how Paul describes himself, according to my earnest expectation, there is an eager longing in Paul's life, an eagerness to be with God. It is better to be with Christ, he asserts in verse 23. And he has that assurance that whatever happens, that's where he will be. Later, John would write in 1 John 5, 13, I have written these things that you may know that you have eternal life. And that knowledge of eternal life is not something that grows and matures and develops and 
we, we're more in heaven than we would have been when we started if we'd left this planet earlier, if we'd left this life earlier. But from the moment that we become Christians, that knowledge and that certainty, that assurance of eternal life is there if we but continue in the light as he is in the light. It's better to be with Christ, but right now we can be. Right now we can be living like him and for him. And in verses 25 and 26, and do you notice in verse 25, and being confident of this, he revisits this expression that we are to help others in the meantime, to make the world better, to improve the lot of those around us. It's fascinating to me as someone who, who just enjoys history to see the benefits that Christianity has always brought to a society when it has brought in a way that Christ, that God intended it to be in that society. We have to be the ones that bring a fragrance and aroma of Christ into the lives of those around us and help others understand the glories and the freedoms that are found only in Jesus because we are being assured by him. In chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, we're going to read down to verse 4 initially. Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look not, uh, look out not for only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Paul is encouraging us here that we need to be hopeful, that we need to uh, be in a state of being hopeful, having this hope of which he speaks, that he describes as consolation in Christ, comfort of love, fellowship of the Spirit, affection and mercy. If any of those things exist, these preconditions that are set out there, if those things happen, if those things are real, if they are tangible, then we can fulfill joy and realize the hope that is meant to be had by each of us. <clears throat> How would we best describe our relationship with God? God who reveals himself. Would we describe it as an epiphany, like a burning bush in the wilderness? Would we describe it as an intellectual understanding because we have the word? After all, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Would we see it as a penitent life given over to repentance and turning our lives over to God? Would we see it in the terms of a faithful confession that it is Christ who is Lord and we are his servants and submit to him. Would we see it in our baptism or being added to Christ, putting on Christ through baptism in order to enjoy all the blessings and all the wonders and joys that God has in store for us? All those things are in and of themselves part of how God wants us to come into our relationship with him. But here's the thing about a relationship. It's only a relationship if you're spending time with someone. It's only a relationship if you're invested in that other person. Two people get married. They spend their years together, five years, 20 years, 45 years. They make their journey together. Perhaps it goes on longer, but that bond that exists between them gets closer and closer and stronger and stronger because they are together. The bond between parent and child that takes years to fully nurture, maybe 30 years, maybe 20 years, maybe longer, maybe less, in which time that bond that seems almost unbreakable is developed. Why? Because of a relationship where time and effort is placed. God calls us into community. He is community. By declaring him to be Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we express that God himself is community. Not a community, God is community. And he has called us to put on Christ and be in Christ, which means that we are meant to be part of that community that we call church. 
we might put the name on the door and say the church of Christ, meaning Christ's community, Christ's people. That's what it's supposed to mean. Oh, and how we've been starved of it in the last year. So deprived that we have struck out into technology just to try and maintain a glimpse of it. Try and hold on to something that keeps us in contact with it. We are called to this hope of community with him. Notice how in verse 2, how we can fulfill Paul's joy by being like-minded. Like Father, like Son, and like Holy Spirit. Think about others and think highly of them. He says in verse 3 there, let each esteem others better than himself. What did Christ do? You think of John chapter 13. What did he do? He takes a towel. He takes a basin of water. What does he do? He starts washing feet. And they don't even realize that at first, until eventually the room gets quieter and quieter and he comes to Peter. You can read the story in John 13. Why does Jesus do this? He goes on and explains. Here's the example. If I, being the master, have washed your feet, what are you going to do? If you're the servants of the master, but the master washes feet, what are you going to do? Because the washing of feet is typically the lowest job in the household. If you were a slave in a household, that's the job you didn't want. And in this day and age, knowing some of you, I can vouch that that's probably the case. I wouldn't want that job, but Jesus took it. And if he's willing to do it, what about us? Because he thinks about others and he thinks highly of them because we are created in the image of God. And if we have that community with God expressed through his church, and we really understand what that community of God is as we experience it in the church, and we see his service to each of us, his grace given to each one of us, his love demonstrated to each one of us, what would you hold back? So in verse 4, Paul says, let each one of you, each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Selfishness has to be set aside. Self-interest, that's still necessary. We still have to consider our needs. We still have to meet our needs. We still have to consider the needs of our family. We still have to consider the needs of our employers. We still have to consider the needs of our creditors if we have bills to pay. But we should never forget that others need as well. And that God's place must be clear in our own mind. So being hopeful, we recognize the better things that God has prepared for us that are in his church. Beginning in verse 5, we pick up one of the most beautiful passages, one of Adam's many favorite passages. Uh, if they start in Genesis, they finish in Revelation, he likes them all. But beginning in verse 5, as we all do, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of a God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bond servant and coming in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth. And, can, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord to the glory of God the Father. We need to discover how we can be clear. Clear in our own minds, clear in our understanding of who our God is and what our God has done for us. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. To have the mind of Jesus is to have the mind of a servant. By example, he chose to be lowly in verse 6. By choice, he chose to be a servant in verse 7, even to the point of dying for the will of God. Are we clear on that? If, if there were a conversation between the Father and the Word before the Word became flesh and dwelt amongst us, in which God said, you can take one thing of God with you when you become a human. What would you choose? I think Jesus would have said, servanthood. Isn't that remarkable? Would you take the omnipotence, all the power and glory of God, all the knowledge of God, 
all the presence of God? Would you take the eternal nature of God? Would you want to live forever on earth? Or choose to be a servant? Do you understand what it means to be a Christian about caring for others? About considering what he did for us? What a beautiful passage that Paul writes there for us. We go down to verse 14 as we continue with our lesson this morning and begin there in verse 12. Not that I have already attained or I'm already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward calling of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let us, as many as are mature, have this mind, and if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us be of the same mind. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Looking at what lies ahead. Focused on it. Seeing the goal. Attaining to that confidence. Look at what that prize is. It is set up for us a crown of life in heaven. But more than that, it is set up for us that apartment, that place within the kingdom. It's here and now, not just then. A place within God's kingdom to be called as Paul puts it in Romans chapter 8, fellow heirs with Christ. But more than that, to be with him. To be with God. Not a burning bush. To be with God. Not a cloud that descended on a mountain and made the whole area tremble as though an earthquake could not stop. To be with God, not in the banks of the sea or the river as God held back or parted the waters. To be with God, not just sitting in a field listening to his words in the Sermon on the Mount. To be with God, not just in a garden wondering who took the body. To be with God, not just uh, on the mountain watching him as he ascended into heaven. To be with God. Not just standing at the right hand of the throne of heaven as Stephen died. To be with God. To actually be there. In all the fullness and all the majesty and all the glory that defies any human words that we can conjure. To try and describe what it means to be with God. Do you see the price? Do you see that upward calling that there is in God? That's what matters. A crown. You'll get a crown, but you'll be with God. Eternal life. You'll get eternal life, but you'll be with God. The taking away of sin and misery and pain and tears. Yes. But you'll be with God. And we achieve it by having the same standard. In the same mind of which he speaks in verse 16. This is what makes God's people God's people. That we listen, uh, listen to and obey his voice. Which means we are having to be focused on that eternality. When we get up in the morning with prayer. As we lay our head down at night with prayer. As we sit down at a meal with prayer. As we take some time for our lives with God, with study, or with fellowship with one another, where perhaps more than in anything else, we truly experience the community of God. To be focused on that prize that lies ahead of us. Paul would go on and say in verse 20, for our citizenship is in heaven from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, 
who will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. In chapter 1, verse 6, Paul opens up with this idea of how tra transformation begins by allowing God to work within us. In Philippians 2, beginning in verse 12, therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, <clears throat> but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. And in chapter 3 and verse 21, transformation. You know, when you grow, you grow when you set your targets higher. The problem for most of us isn't that we set our targets too high and mess. It's that we set them too low and we keep hitting them and we wonder why we're never getting anywhere because the targets are too near us. We need to set ourselves a target that allows for transformation. What a transformation we have witnessed in the last year. Who would have thought at the beginning of 2020, getting ready for that year. I remember getting a message from Nick Wilson and you know, we're talking about the men's day that we had in 2020. And we used 2020, the vision of God for the church, for the Christian. And he wrote back and he said, you've stolen my idea. We were going to do that at the end of the month for the fourth Valley meeting. Perhaps they still did. A whole year of 2020, we spoke about focus at camp. That was going to be the, the lesson for that year. Focus, 2020. COVID has transformed it. Here we are wearing masks, denied by law, about singing in our worship service and finding a way to at least in our hearts express that working with the Holy Spirit of our joy and experience of the community of Christ. Transformed by those that we have lost or have been affected and survived, but have never really fully recovered from COVID, from the hygiene procedures, from the missing of the tables in the community and having to stand outside in the rain just to say hello to somebody for a few minutes or being on Zoom for the best part of a year. If a tiny little virus, and it's smaller than that, there's about a million, if I had them right there, I don't have them, so you're okay. If a little virus invisible to the human eye were able to grind the entire world to a halt and transform it in the way that it has, what about the one who created all things? What transformation is going to happen when God is allowed to work, when God is allowed to make a difference in our lives, when we take on the responsibilities of God to allow us to be transformed. Paul would say of the, uh, the Philippians in chapter 4, verse 1, Therefore, my beloved and longed-for brethren, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, beloved. Whose joy and crown have we been transformed into? For Paul, it meant everything to him that he could see this transformation going on in their life. It's fascinating to me that Paul uses different words throughout this particular epistle, like esteem, consider, count, confident, trust, approve, earnest expectation, think, like-minded, mind, set, and care. And he uses about five different Greek words, and they all mean pretty much the same thing. Think, be convinced in your mind, hold a good judgment, think with your head, critically examine with understanding. We talk about the book of Philippians as a book about joy. We may even realize that it says more about Christ, but my goodness, Paul is calling us to realize in our own minds how they can be transformed by this knowledge of Christ and to attain to the joy and crown that our Lord would happily wear and looks expectantly to wear.
because of our confident focus and the assurance that we are learning to think the way Christians ought to think. By being transformed, we can transform all around us. God bless you. Thank you, Graham, for that. <clears throat> for this next uh, song, it's, fr it's from a song called Cornerstone. And I've just taken one line from it that I want us to, to just look at the words and just think about them while I say them. Christ the Lord is our cornerstone. The weak are made strong in the Saviour's love. Through the storm, he is Lord. Lord of all. Let's give back to our Lord. If you'd like to turn with me, I'll be reading from Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 55. I'll be reading from the New Living Translation, Life Application Study Bible. Is anyone thirsty? Come and drink, even if you have no money. Come take your choice of wine or milk. It's all free. If you spend our money on food that does not give you strength, why spend your money on food that does not give you strength? Why pay for food that does you no good? Listen to me and you will eat what is good. You will enjoy the finest food. Come to me with ears wide open. Listen, and you will find life. I will make an everlasting covenant with you. I will give you all the unfailing love I promised to David. See how I used him to display my power among the people. I made him a leader among the nations. You will also, also command your, you will also command nations you do not know, and people unknown to you will come running to obey because I, the Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel, have made you glorious. Seek the Lord while you can find him. Call on him now while, while he is near. You know, food costs money, which lasts only a short time and meets only our physical needs. But we are offered free nourishment that feeds our souls by God through Jesus. And, you know, we ask, how do we get this free nourishment that Isaiah was talking about? We are to come, and verse 1 tells us, come and drink, come take your choice, it is free. In John chapter 4, Jesus tells us, Anyone who drinks water will become thirsty again, but those who the water I give will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh bubbling spring within you, giving you eternal life. As our bodies hunger and thirst, so does our souls. But our souls need spiritual food and water in John chapter 7, Jesus basically tells us, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. For the scriptures declared rivers of living water flow from the heart of anyone who believes in Jesus. We must listen. In verse 2, we are told, listen to me and you will eat what is good. And then we, we must seek and call on God. Verse 6 tells us, seek the Lord while you can find him. Call on him while he is near. Isaiah tells, tells us to call on the Lord while he is near. It's not that God is planning to move away from us, but it's us that often move away from Jesus. Erecting barriers of sin between us 
we should be seeking God while we can before it's too late. You know, we have everything that we need and it's free. This nourishment that we have, you know, from God to feed our, you know, spiritual soul, spiritual soul is basically all that we need. Everything else that we have is access to requirements. You know, we may be feeling that we don't have much to offer, especially in the current situation that we're in. A lot of people are struggling to cope with what's going on around us. And it, it feels like, you know, we may have nothing at all to give because the hardship that we're, that many people are going through at this time. But it's nothing compared to the hardship, you know, that Paul went through in Second Corinthians. It, in Second Corinthians chapter six, starting at verse eight, we serve God whether people honor us or despise us, whether they slander us or praise us. We are honest, but they call us imposters. We ignore them. We are ignored, even though we we are well known. We live close to death, but we are still alive. We have been beaten, but we have not been killed. Our hearts sake, but always have joy. We are pure, we are poor, but we give spiritual riches to others. We own nothing, and yet we have everything. You know, in Matthew chapter 10, Jesus gave the disciples a principle to guide their actions as they ministered to others. <coughs> and it's basically, give us freely as you have received. And the same principle applies to us with all the blessings that we have received. You know, freely from God. Everything we have is meaningless without God. We are asked to give back a portion of what God has freely given to us so that the work that we do may continue. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for the blessings that you've given to us. We know that we only need the nourishment that comes from your word. Everything else we have is excess to our requirements or to our needs. We ask that what we get back to the church will be used wisely. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, something from verse 13, it says, But we do not want to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of the, an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Before the closing prayer, let us encourage each other 
with the words of the of the hymn when we all get to heaven. Again, just follow the cues in the screen, and if you're able, please be upstanding and remain standing for the closing prayer. <coughs> Sing the wondrous love of Jesus, sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, he'll prepare for us a place. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. We all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. We we'll walk the pilgrim pathway, clouds will overspread the sky. But when traveling days are over, not a shadow, not a sigh. Let the men say. <coughs> Let us all say. Let us then be true and faithful, trusting, serving every day. Just one glimpse of him in glory will the toils of life repay. Let the women say. Let us all say, onward to the prize before us, soon his beauty will behold. Soon the pearly gates will open and we shall tread the streets of gold. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Amen. God bless you. Let's all join together in prayer. Prayer for the week. Our Father in heaven, we come before you in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Saviour. And Father, as we have a public communal prayer this morning, let us always remember to also pray in private, as our Lord exampled and asked us to do. As he separated himself from the disciples at times to pray, Father, to you. Let us bow in thanks and glory. We request, Father, that we can ask in belief. And believe, Father, as we are asked to pray earnestly in spirit and truth. We ask, Father, that you bless us by strengthening our faith and our love for you and for one another, that we may glorify your holy name. There are so many, Father, in the world who have not come to know you and your wonderful Son. Please let us look to every opportunity to share your love, to share the gospel with others. Father, day to day we rely upon your strength, because we are weak forgetful and often lack focus or concentration at times, Father. So please strengthen us, help us know your will for us and give us the power and the strength to carry it out, Father. And Father, we bring before you those of our number who are suffering through age or infirmity. We ask you to encourage them, Father, and strengthen them and Father, those who have lost loved ones and those who have different infirmities just now, Father, we ask you to comfort them, Father. Just as Jesus was raised, Father, you raised your son from the dead. May we believers be with all thanks and praise to you in the coming week, Father. As a mother hen with her chicks, help us to rely on you, Father, to protect us and keep us from sin and evil. Please grant us your forgiveness, because we do. We are all sinners, Father, and we do ask for it. Father, we do thank you and praise you and glorify you. In your dear son's name, amen. <clears throat>